Christopher Hui, welcome to In Conversation. Thanks for having me, Wei. Hong Kong's got this big plan about building the city into a crypto hub. Given what's happened, are you having second thoughts mm -hmm. about building Hong Kong into a crypto hub? Mm. Um, first of all, I think we should cast the net wider. It's not just crypto, but I think virtual asset. Um, and similar to many things in the world, there are two sides to it. On the one hand, there are positive sides to it. In terms of the underlying technology, you talk about blockchain, where without intermediaries, the process of transmission or payment is actually seamless. So in that regard, there's a reduction in transaction cost in terms of many things that we do, not just in the financial world, but also in the trade world or in other areas of the economy. So, but on the other hand, because of the anonymous nature of these transactions, they are susceptible to like uh, money laundering or terrorist financing. And if you actually look around the world, many different jurisdictions are looking to see how they can strike the right balance in terms of extracting the positive sides to it, while at the same time minimizing the negative impact. Because after all, virtual asset, I'm sure all of you will agree that it's going to stay. It's just how we should regulate it and also how we can make the regulation better. Is trading crypto in your good book or bad book? Um, I think your question may be a little bit affected by what has been reasoning, recently happening in terms of the fall of many um, virtual asset exchanges. But I would say in terms of policy making, we have to look at the fundamentals in the long term in terms of what this segment is all about. Um, if you look at the policy statement we issued, basically we lay out very clearly in terms of how we view this and also our aspiration. Because as, you, as I said earlier, the positivities in this area, including reduction in transaction cost and also making the payment process more seamless so and so forth, all of these are positive elements to every economy. And the challenge or the issue for us as regulators or the government is how we can enhance these elements and also extract them in the process. Because after all, this is going to do good to the economy over the long term. Unless you let this market grow and develop, um, these positive elements cannot be harnessed. But yet at the same time, due to the enormous nature of these transactions, they are susceptible to risk like money laundering, etc. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to have regulations in place. That's all good, but the fact is 2022 was just a horrific year not just in terms of plunging values, but also very well-established players going into bankruptcy. It does feel a bit that Hong Kong is arriving at a party that's pretty much over. I won't describe it that way because many of these technological developments take time and also there are stages to it. If you look at how these the fiasco you mentioned uh, unraveling in recent years, I think the issue is about the lack of regulation because none of these entities, I would say, are well regulated. And that's why what we should do is not to evade them, but at the same time, try to see what is the better regulation we can put in place mm. to ensure that this sector can grow in a responsible and sustainable manner. If that's look, interesting. You think better regulation could have prevented the case of, say, um, FTX? Uh, I won't comment on the individual cases, of course, because they are now in the legal process. But what I would say as a broad policy matter is that if you look at how we devise our regulatory approach, we try to have a comprehensive one, not just looking at the payment side of it, not just looking at a money laundry perspective of it, but more broadly, investor protection and also financial stability. To say more specifically, for example, if you look at how we regulate the virtual asset exchanges that now uh, we are going to do uh, from June this year, basically uh, we require these exchanges to segregate their client assets from the assets of the own exchange in such a way that there's a proper mm -hmm. segregation mm -hmm. between the assets of the exchange and that of their clients is number one. And number two, in terms of the financial strength and financial underlying of these uh, exchanges, there's the need for them to maintain a certain level of financial resources and to meet our financial resources requirements. And thirdly, in terms of the avoidance of conflict of interest, um, these exchanges cannot themselves engage in proprietary market-making activities. So all these requirements, I would say, are similar 
to what you see in terms of how we regulate a former or formal uh, financial institution or exchange, and in such a way that we are actually, as I said, putting them under similar rules and regulations mm -hmm. so long as they are presenting similar risk to our financial ecosystem. FTX and Crypto.com and Binance were all founded here in Hong Kong. They all left precisely because of the set of regulations that you were just talking about. It doesn't sound like you plan to loosen these regulations at all. So why do you think the companies will come back? Um, I think, first of all, I can say that after the issuance of our policy statement and also in terms of our plan to um, formulate legislation in terms of the regulation of virtual asset exchanges and also some other user cases for the sector, uh, we have been witnessing quite a strong response from the market. Like for example, for Invest Hong Kong, which is our investment agency, promotion agency, uh, so far I think they received around like 60 inquiries from various play players in the virtual asset space. So I think as a matter of fact, you see that uh, our regulatory response has been well received, that's number one. And number two, similar to many things we do in Hong Kong, we don't compete with others, but we compete with ourselves in terms of leveraging our advantages, being part of China, yet at the same time connected with the rest of the world, and to see how we can scale for the heights in our financial market development. But do you have a picture of what it would look like at the end of this journey? Are we talking about regular people having crypto assets in their savings account? People are looking to see how they can get exposure to it. But that said, at the same time, we also have to look at the potential volatility in this market, because after all, it is really relatively a nascent market. At the same time, there has been going a lot of ups and downs recently, as you highlighted. So I would say, after all, it was going to be a process. But that said, in terms of the final destiny or final outcome, I think it's very hard to say, because after all, uh, technology do intermingle with societies, and we're talking about human beings here, and how they will react to these developments and whether there will be new innovations, I really depends on how technology intermingle with people and also societies, like what we've seen in other areas of technological developments. Previously, Hong Kong only allowed professional investors to invest in cryptocurrencies. In hindsight, that probably saved a lot of mom and pop investors from losing the shirt on their back. But you've recently said you're looking into allowing retail participation. Why? I think in terms of the way we look at this sector, as I said, definitely it's going to stay. So the issue or challenge for us is how we could better regulate it and to make sure that, first of all, the risks that, that emerge will be uh, discerned and also better managed. At the same time, investors are duly protected. And that's why, in terms of regulation of the virtual asset exchanges, we already have these types of safeguards in terms of how we should avoid, like, for example, conflict of interest of these exchanges, mm -hmm. and also to ensure that the client's assets being kept or custodized by them are separate or not commingled with um, the assets of the exchanges so on and so forth. So apart from that, we also have to look at the more detailed regulation in terms of how we can better allow retail access to this segment, yet at the same time to better protect them. And that's why this, we need to have a consultation with the market soon to take place to see what are the additional requirements at the regulatory level, not at the law level, but at the regulatory level, that we need to put in place in such a way that we can, on the one hand, allow retail segment participation, yet at the same time, protect their interests. What happened with FTX was a clear case of fraud. They essentially lied about what they did with other people's money. But that aside, cryptocurrencies are still intrinsically volatile. Why allow people who can't afford to lose that much invest in something that goes up and down 50, 90% a day? I think what 
you call for in this area is apart from better regulation, is also about uh, better investor education. Because after all, um, as a responsible or as an informed uh, investor, you need to know what you're going in, getting into. And that's why, apart from having this law and regulation in place, we are also trying to beef up the investor ed education that we are going to provide to the market. Uh, we have under our regulator an investor education committee, investor education in such a way that people in general can make better or better informed investment decisions. And virtual assets is definitely an area that they are looking into. What level of sophistication would that require? Because from news reports, uh, even the HKMA, the central bank, lost money in the FTX, didn't it? Um, I think in general, what, you say, what I would say is that this is something really look at, not just at the level of understanding of the investors about these products, but also the product itself, in terms of the features, the complexity, so on and so forth. And that's why we need to consult the market in terms of what are the detailed regulations we need to put in place mm. to, on the one hand, allow retail access, yet at the same time to have investor protection in place. That's number one. And number two, in terms of the technology itself, uh, while there are positivities to it, as I highlighted, in terms of reduction in transaction cost, uh, the seamless nature of the payments, so on and so forth, yet at the same time, because many of these technologies are anonymous in nature, so in such a way that with people hiding behind technology, mm -hmm. they are subject to like money laundering yep. or terrorist financing, this sort of risk. And again, these are the risks that you also normally see in the um, conventional financial ecosystem. That's right. And that's why you have international organizations yeah. like FedEx looking into this. So what we would try to do is basically to have the regulation in place to regulate this segment, given the fact that they are presenting similar risk, even though they are outside the conventional financial ecosystem. What would most likely to be the category that it eventually falls under in terms of regulation. Mm. Of course, if you're talk talking about like securities related, uh, there are securities type virtual assets, but of course there could be also like uh, virtual assets with different underlines. That they could be uh, properties, they could be uh, funds or other types of assets. So basically we are talking about a very broad range here. And in terms of our regulation, I think that's clear we deal with both. The securities type of the virtual asset, it will be regulated under our securities and futures ordinance because we talk about securities here. Mm -hmm. But for the uh, non-securities type of virtual asset uh, with underlyings which are not securities, it will be regulated under our anti-money laundering regulation and law in this real area. Anti-money laundering and anti-terror financing, very important areas that are also huge financial burdens on banks. And banks are, you know, grown up, well-established companies. Do you really expect crypto startups to be able to shoulder the same type of burden? Mm -hmm. um, I think as you can see, even before the enactment of our law uh, to be effective in June, we already have two virtual asset exchanges regulated by SFC. So you can see that already there are players here uh, subject to our regulation, that's number one. And number two, I would say, in the process of redrafting the law, uh, we, the government and also regulators, have been in consultation with the market in terms of, first of all, looking at what are the technological developments going on in this sector, and also what are the key trends that we need to look into before we put up the law. So basically, I would say it is an iterative process.
when you guys came up with this plan, did you give the PBOC a heads up? Is Beijing on board with this? Um, virtual assets is not just a China issue or Hong Kong issue. It is a global issue. If you go to many international forums, uh, like Central Bankers Forum or Securities Regulators Forum, basically they talk about it all the time because it's a new element to a conventional financial ecosystem and people are grappling with ways to how better to regulate them. But I'm specifically asking, how does the government in Beijing view Hong Kong's plan to develop into a virtual asset hub as you would have it? What I'm saying, I think it's very clear that what we have tried to do is very consistent in terms of how we operate our market so far, mm -hmm. in terms of how we deal with international requirements, how we deal with these international trends, and also at the same time how we deal with these new developments as they come up locally. So I see no issue in terms of we coming up with our new laws and also new regulations to regulate this segment, mm -hmm. which is specific to Hong Kong. You've specifically said that you welcome crypto companies in mainland China to relocate to Hong Kong because of that regulation difference. Um, Hong Kong is an international city. It is part of China. So our vision is always global in terms of what we try to draw here to this part of the world. So uh, as I said, basically there are the emergence of two trends, which is one at the national level and one at the local level. And that's why when we cast our vision, basically it's not just Hong Kong, not just Asia, but globally. And, and everywhere in the world, we have players who can uh, benefit from our regulatory regime, who see opportunities here, and also comply with our requirements and the law, we are basically most welcome for them to join us. So as long as the mainland regulatory regime does not change, people basing here shouldn't hold out that hope? Um, I think everyone has to be law-abiding. Speaking of the broader financial industry, the past three years, I have to be honest with you, I went to many going away parties, a lot of times for people in the financial industry. And a lot of people left with anger in their hearts because they couldn't see their families for three years, their children couldn't go to school. When you try to get them to come back, how can you reassure them that this is not going to happen again? I think the message is very clear. If you look at what Hong Kong is now like, uh, like for example our airport, basically is full of people. Yet at the same time, our chief executive and the government team has sent a very strong and clear message to the whole world that Hong Kong is back. I would say, if you talk about long term or mid term in terms of where people choose to locate their business or to develop their career, I think one thing is for sure, they will look at two things. Number one is the opportunities. Like for example, your good self, uh, you come to work in Hong Kong for a specific reason, because it's an opportunity for you to grow your career. And the opportunities that Hong Kong has to offer is very obvious. We are part of China, we are connected to the world, and especially in the financial areas which I oversee, basically there are enormous opportunities in terms of where we build more connectivity with the mainland, where we further enhance the competitiveness of our stock market, and how we venture and also develop ourselves into a green finance hub and also fintech hub and now of course virtual space, virtual asset space. And apart from the career options and also career considerations, the other aspect to a person's choice and uh, consideration of looking at themselves on family, of course, is the broader family and also broader livelihood issues. At the same time, we have a very strong pool of financial talent, not just from Hong Kong, not just from China, but globally. I think all these are going to stay and also more will come. Another major concern for the business community based on our conversations is legal uncertainty. Some of your colleagues in the Hong Kong government, including the chief executive, Mr. John Lee, are now paid in cash because U.S. sanctions makes it impossible for banks to get them bank accounts here in Hong Kong. At the same time, the national security law makes it a criminal offense to enforce a foreign sanctions in a city. The way things are, wouldn't you say that part of the national security law simply isn't enforceable? I think after all, in terms of how the financial institutions assess their, assess their obligations towards the laws of different jurisdictions, is something that they need to look really into in terms of the legal obligations and how susceptible they are to these regulations. But one thing is for sure, 
that Hong Kong is a place where international banks and institutions and companies operate, and it has been so even after the enactment of national security law. In terms of making more investments into Hong Kong, making bigger commitments to here, don't you think that that's an overhang that people must think about this legal conflict? Um, I don't think so, because after all, this is not something that is new to Hong Kong. After all, every jurisdiction has its own national security law. Uh, and also at the same time, in terms of the ambit of additional security law, it's very clear, confining to certain areas. In terms of how our market has been operating, I think you can see that the law has been in place for quite some time. Yet at the same time, our markets continue to operate well and also resiliently. And there's no doubt about it. So I think it's clear that we are a jurisdiction where people can take the government to court as they win. So in such a way that the rule of law is very much prevailing, at the same time, it's still part of a financial and also commercial culture. Thank you so much, Christopher Hui, for coming on In Conversation. Okay, thank you.